Hi, I'm Mark Zimmer. I'm here today at the Sheboygan County Historical Museum with my display of antique radios. And we're going to give you kind of an overview of the history of radio and some examples of what is in my collection. Um, I've always been fra fascinated with radio. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my uncle gave me my first antique radio, and that kind of set the bug in me, which uh, really took off after I finished uh, school. I found my first antique radio, and from then I never looked back. So um, I've been a collector now for, uh, oh, at least 45 years, I guess. And uh, I do have a private collection that's quite extensive and represents the whole history and technology of the radio industry. Um, radio really first got its start in the early teens and uh, during World War I is when the technology really took off and developed and uh, a lot of the major players during that time were involved in uh, wartime technology production for the United States government and uh, was used in World War I in the trenches and of course back then in its infancy radio was mainly used for communication during the trench warfare time of the war and uh, uh, one gentleman named Edwin Armstrong uh, was uh, instrumental in creating the radio circuitry and uh, necessary technologies to provide that radio service to the troops. And of course after the war was over um, it was recognized that radio was an up-and-coming technology that could be used for broadcast of entertainment and news to the public and so at first all that was available was uh, kits and plans and the individual had to build their own radio because there were none available in the store and if we come over here we'll see an example of a homemade radio set from the early 20s this is a homemade set that was made in about 1921 and it features uh, over here is a crystal tuner and that's where the antenna uh, was hooked into and the radio waves were picked up by moving this little lever around there's a little poker on the end of this lever and it hits a galena crystal and once that circuit is complete it would transmit the radio waves into this contraption here which is a, a both a tuner which has got a slide on it here that allowed you to go up and down the radio dial you might say and this is an inductance uh, system for changing the capacitance of the condenser which is this it's a technical thing but that's how people listen to radio back then it required no power other than plugging it into a very long antenna wire and then of course in the very early days of radio uh, a company was formed by a gentleman named David Sarnoff who was an immigrant from Russia and David uh, created a company you may have heard of called Radio Corporation of America or RCA and RCA was simply a paper company but David was smart and he contracted both General Electric and Westinghouse to design and produce the first some of the first radios to the public for uh, for their use in receiving entertainment news and this is an example right here of one of the first radios made by the Radio Corporation of America, or RCA. And uh, it's also a, a crystal set as well. It uses no tubes. It works pretty much like that radio I just described to you. Uh, this is a tuner to go up and down the radio dial. And this is your, your detector, as it's called. There'd be a little galena in there, and then this would make contact with that. It would again complete the radio circuit. And these various little screws here is where you hooked your radio antenna, your ground, your headphones. You could only listen to this with a headphone. And of course, this is another example of an early radio crystal set. 
with the crystal on top. You can see the little gizmo picking around on the Galena crystal, and this is your tuner here. Then it went from crystal sets to early tuned radio frequency type radios, and we have some different examples. This is a one tube radio right here. There's the tube, and you have your, your little tuner up here in the front that you adjust, and this is your um, uh, inductance for your uh, receiving your radio waves. So it's a very basic set was very affordable back in the day. Uh, you know, it was kind of like the everyman radio, not unlike the Model T Ford. And of course, you used headphones to listen to this radio too. Technology continued to evolve. It, uh, this is one of the first portable radios that you could take to the beach. And this one was made in 1924. It's a, a Crosley radio and it's it's in a leather case, it all folded up. And of course, you can see here inside, the technology is pretty simple. There's not much to it. These little spider web things here is how you adjusted your inductance again to uh, get the maximum output of your radio signal. And of course, it did have a, a dial for tuning the frequency, WHBL, uh, any, anything 620 AM Milwaukee, that's how you did it with that. And these are different uh, tap settings for uh, setting your different uh, inductances. And of course, you have your volume control over here. And these are all your different hookups for your batteries. It used different types of batteries to make it work. So you were not only lugging the radio to the beach, but you needed a, a, a loudspeaker, which is what this is. This is an early Magnavox radio speaker. So you'd hook that all together, and then you had to lug along your, your batteries, too. And those batteries weren't your little A and B, C and D type battery cells. They were big, long cylinders and boxes of, of batteries. So it was kind of a, a pain, but that was technology at its finest back in 1924. Um, here's another fine example of a 1923 radio for in the home. It has a built-in loop antenna on it. You know, a lot of times people had to go outside and string up a wire from the house over to a tree or something. But this one had a built-in radio and it was made by a, a company called DeForest, which was part of Lee DeForest's uh, operation and it has little portholes in here so you can see the tubes and when you're operating it and they you'd see the glow of the tubes through those portholes and uh, it has a, a place down underneath to store various uh, let's see if I can get that open you could store various things in here like extra radio tubes and uh, certain types of technical uh, uh, inductance, frequency acceptors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, and it all closed up. You know, they tried to make things look like a fine piece of furniture back in those days, because this was the latest thing. You know, um, it's like the new flat screen TVs of the day. Only this is 1923, <laughs> but uh, that was a proud piece in the family's home. So. Because of that, a lot of companies took advantage of that and they tried to make it into art. And that's what this is. This is a, an old 1927 Super 8 Nutra Wound, it's called. And as you can see, it's got a very unique design to it. And tuning it required tuning all three of these dials to make, uh, make it uh, accept a radio frequency. So if you were trying to listen to WHBL or something else. You'd tune this one to here and this one to there and this one to here and then you'd monkey with your volume control and your uh, inductance settings and things of that nature. And after a little fiddling, you'd be able to pick up WHBL. And they had a lot of power, but it was a lot of messing around. Um, again, 
here's a, a Atwater Kent, which was a very popular radio in its day as well. And Atwater Kent was kind of considered the Cadillac of radio manufacturers back in the 20s. And uh, they started out with, uh, again, a radio that operates off of batteries and, and a loudspeaker. And uh, inside, it's, it's pretty simple. You can see the tubes in there. It was a five-tube radio and uh, had uh, the, th the three tuning capacitors on it that all three had to be tuned in to a certain degree in order to uh, achieve uh, radio sound. Um, radio continued to develop in the 20s at a very fast pace and by 1928 they actually were making the first electric radios for the consumer to buy. Ones that didn't require lugging all the batteries, you just simply plugged them into the wall and plugged in your antenna. So this is an example of the first electric radio manufactured by Atwater Kent in 1928. And um, it does play. As you can see, it has all tubes in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven tubes. And um, each tube had a specific duty in the operation of the radio. The big one in the back operated, regulated the power for the uh, different tubes. This tube here is what they called the de de detector tube. And it operated very similar to those crystal radio sets I was showing earlier, where you had to poke the galena to get the signal. That's a, that was your signal receiver. And then you have uh, tubes in here that uh, amplify the sound, uh, audio amplifier tubes, and the other tubes that work in the uh, radio circuitry. So this was a self-contained radio, the first electric has a rather unique speaker too, which was uh, part of the whole operation. And of course we've got some vintage 1928 music being transmitted into the receiver right now. And it, radio continued to develop and by the late 30s, most of the technology and circuit de design had gotten to the peak level of what AM could do in the marketplace. And we have an example over here of a couple of radios. <clears throat> this is a Detroit Ola from 1937. By the time this radio was made in a short 10-year segment, radio was already coming up to the uh, peak or the zenith of its ability uh, to receive uh, signals and you could not only get AM signals like WHBL but it also had shortwave bands on it so you could listen to the police band and you could listen to the various shortwave bands so you could hear uh, London and Germany and China all in this set and um, by the uh, late 30s and early 40s, Edwin Armstrong, the gentleman who was instrumental in some of the first radio technology, had invented FM broadcasting or frequency modulation broadcasting. And we all know that FM is uh, far superior to AM in, as far as static and noise goes. And FM began its course in pretty much phasing out what we today know that AM is a thing of the past and FM is where things are before streaming came into existence. So it's a long story, it's, it's interesting history, it's fascinating technology and I'm glad that I'm able to share it with you today. My name is Sandy Colby and I am a collector of snow people. We are looking at various cross stitch and other hand stitched snow people on the big red board and now we're going to walk over to some of the stuff that I've done. We have a quilt on the bottom 
And most of the rest of these are crocheted. We also have some embroideries that were done on some automatic machines. We also have a few ties that are just thrown into the rest, but most of the rest of these have been crocheted or quilted. Everything on the Christmas tree has been cross-stitched. They are all patterns that I have. And then we have this batch over here, which are mostly crocheted. However, we do have a few things that are bought. Well, I'm Chuck Bourne, and I'm a local Sheboygan Falls farmer. And uh, this started, I think, when I was 10 years old. I opened the Farm Journal magazine and uh, saw that John Deere was getting done with the two cylinders and going to four cylinders tractors. It was called the New Generation Tractors. And I, when I was 10 years old, I said, that's my tractor. I, like, I love them. I love the body styles on them. And uh, I still farm with uh, 3020 and 24010s. So uh, I started collecting these, oh, back in the 90s, I guess. Most of these are from implement dealers. Um, this is a, that's a 3010. That's one of the first ones they came out with in the 4010s. And uh, I also collect Lionel trains at home, and these are some uh, trains that came out with the new generation John Deere's on them. And uh, these are all this size and then they're starting to come out with, what are these, 132nd tractors now? And I kind of like to collect them because they're a little smaller and they don't take the shelf space. But And the interesting thing is uh, somewhere in the 60s John Deere decided to uh, they were making garden tractors and they thought they could sell more by painting them different colors. And uh, it didn't go over too big. And they ended up painting a lot of these green and selling them and if you can find them, they're pretty rare. But, um, you know, the, we go into some of the bigger ones. Uh, the 6030 was the most highest horsepower John Deere or a tractor made at its time, two wheel drive, and they made these, oh, up through 76, I believe, the 6030s. So uh, I never had too much use for the uh, two cylinder John Deere's, but these were mechan mechanically simple. There's no electronics whatsoever. You can start them without. The battery even connected, if you run them down a hill, they'll start up and you can work all day with them. So, um, yep, so. This book here tells the, the whole story of uh, how they were developing the four cylinders while still trying to make a living selling the two cylinders. Because um, if the farmers knew that they were coming out with these, they wouldn't buy a two cylinder, so. Hello, my name is Randy Stocky. Uh, I take care of bonsai. Uh, I sort of say it that way because uh, it's almost like having children that you have to care for. Uh, there's some of these that uh, literally you can see that they're, they're rescued, where some people buy uh, something, a bonsai, and they don't know what they're getting themselves into. and I ended up with several of these simply because they don't know what they have and they don't know how to take care of them. And when they're just about dead because they know I take care of plants, I had my own plant business for a few years uh, way back. And so I started saving them, collecting them from other people, bringing them back to life. And it's always just become a hobby, a hobby for me. I've done it almost all my life. I've always liked plants. Uh, the plants on this side of the table are all ones that would be in the house. And the ones on this side of the table all would be ones that uh, would be uh, in the greenhouse at this time of the year. 
there, there's this one here, and it's one of the oldest ones, Tamarack. It, it's probably the oldest one on this table right now, and it grows so slowly because it only has half a season. It only grows half a year, and then it goes dormant. So right now it is in the dormant stage, and it'll just be starting to bud out. You can see where the little buds are all starting to, to come out now. So this tamarack would probably be at least 15 feet tall in the wild had it, had it been growing. So there's a, a few of these. You can take just about any kind of plant or shrub in, the, in nature. Uh, you can take a flowering shrub and do it with. So, and you, I've been doing this just now where you, you train the branches to go a certain direction so you can bend them. Uh, one thing about bonsai, the, the theory of it, is, is that you don't necessarily have branches overlapping themselves any more than necessary. Each branch is like its own arm, its own entity. So you try and train it that way so that every arm has a different or its own direction. So, and that's what I've been doing, and a lot of bonsai is basically just trimming. So some of these, you trim so much per year. You, you train it so much per year. You might leave the wires on for a year or two, and then after that, the branch will stay there normally, naturally. So it's training, and that's what bonsai is all about. I grow my own bon uh, moss right in my own greenhouse so that I always have something to keep it moist. Uh, the, the, that's the thing with bonsais, they always need to keep moist, be no moist. Um, that's why I say they're just like children. You, you need to take care of them almost every day. Uh, if I go on vacation, I, I worry about the people I leave behind just to you know, take care of them while I'm gone. So it's, it's my love. Good morning, my name is David Weinhold. I grew up in Sherman Center on a dairy farm between Adele and Random Lake. And when I moved to Sheboygan Falls to start my career, I started hearing about the Sheboygan Falls Creamery. And I also found out that my uncle used to work for the Creamery as well when he was uh, after high school. So I started collecting bottles probably in the 1980s and um, just found them at antique shows, bottle shows, uh, thrift stores, and estate sales. So my collection includes primarily Sheboygan Falls Creamery items. You particularly can see some of the cooked cheese, cottage cheese containers, the large bottles at the end of the um, display here. And I'm particularly kind of um, fond of finding these things in my uncle's collection which are in the center of the table. Um, some of the premium items that they might have given away during the um, holiday season. And then in addition to the Sheboygan Falls Creamery, I decided to limit my collection to Sheboygan County dairies. So you'll see here on this side of the table um, some examples of Sheboygan dairies. Um, a few, sh the Schlichting bottles, which are very colorful, that are in the um, back of the table. And then um, representative bottles from some of the other Sheboygan dairies in the in the city. Um, and just today, um, one of the other collectors had a few um, bottle caps that he provided. And um, so I've added to my collection just uh, standing here at the collection today um, with a few other bottle caps from some of the Sheboygan dairies that he told me about. So. I did a little research on the creamery as well at the Sheboygan County Historical Research Center in Sheboygan Falls and they provided some additional information and some pictures of the creamery when it was in action um, in Sheboygan Falls. Um, they got sold to Lake to Lake eventually and, um, and but went out of business sometime in the late 1950s. My name is Matthew Sider and I collect bobbleheads. I've probably been collecting bobbleheads for ooh, maybe between eight and ten years now. I've always loved sports, uh, doing sports in the backyard with my brother, soccer, baseball, 
basketball, football, just anything, and watching sports on TV. And collecting things like sports cards or bobbleheads were just ways that you feel closer to the game. So going out to a Brewer game, my mom would always try and pick games where there would be a bobblehead giveaway. And that was kind of the beginning of my collection was going to Brewer games and getting some of the giveaways. As I got older, I really loved going to thrift stores. I also collect sports cards, vinyl records, and bobbleheads. And once I started being able to drive myself to Goodwill, that's when my collection really started to take off. Finding different bobbleheads at Goodwills and St. Vincent de Paul or garage sales and adding them to my collection. Some of the favorites that I have here, I really love the, the vintage ones for the brewers. Also really like the racing sausages, those are some of my favorites. I'm more of a collector of opportunity, uh, if you will, by going to Goodwills. Um, it's not something that I normally just seek out, uh, buying bobbleheads, going on eBay, but when I come across them at a, a good price, I'll snap them up and add them to my collection if I don't already have them. And I think that's how you avoid collecting junk and actually having a collection is when you're content with what you have but also always wanting to improve and I think you'll probably find that a lot of the collectors here will tell you the same thing. Uh, another favorite of mine, some of the Packer ones are from my grandfather uh, on my mom's side. He had a bathroom in his house that was just full floor to ceiling of Packers memorabilia and so he would have these bobbleheads in there and I remember playing with these when I was really little the car and the airplane bobbleheads and so uh, when he passed away he left a lot of these different memorabilia uh, bobbleheads things like that to my brother and myself so those are definitely some of the favorites of my collection I'm Mike Hanlon. I am here as part of the Collectors and Collections with my collection of records and ephemera from the record label Ghost Box Records, uh, which is a record label out of the United Kingdom. Um, the term that most often gets connected to Ghost Box is hauntology. I think uh, a way to think about that in a meta way is sort of a nostalgia for nostalgia, uh, meaning that if you think about things from your childhood, um, you can usually, if there's things that you're trying to remember, you can usually go onto YouTube and see things or listen to things, or you can go to eBay and you can buy things. There's a lot of things that if you want to remember those uh, parts of your past, you can really just go and experience them again. Um, but that's not always the way things were. Uh, there was a time where if you're trying to remember those, um, oftentimes your memory was fuzzy, it was inaccurate, misremembered, or sometimes just uh, completely fabricated. And Ghostbox as a record label has sort of um, built a world around those sort of misremembered uh, memories. Um, all of the design work is created by one guy, uh, one man named Julian House, uh, used to design record covers for other artists as well. Um, and he does all the work for Ghostbox. Um, and it's because of his uh, age and his geography, the record label has a very sort of 60s and 70s British sensibility to it, which isn't necessarily my background and my experience, but I do have um, a fondness for this sort of a style. Uh, I feel like there's a spookiness to it that is what first attracted me to it. So some of the things that I've got, you can see I've got um, all of the records that they've released on vinyl, um, but I've tried to collect some other things as well. So there are posters from concerts that they've put on, uh, magazines with interviews. Um, I actually have a few pieces from other exhibitions, um, other museums that have done some uh, showings of ghost box work. So this is a book that was from a exhibition that happened in the United Kingdom. Um, there's also a couple pieces here that are from an exhibition that happened in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that was in 2016. And I was really excited about it. I first saw that that was happening online and realized, oh, this is actually happening in the United States. So I spent the weekend and drove out to Pittsburgh on my own just so I could go see the things that were there. 
Um, also a lot of prints uh, that they created for promotional purposes for some of the things that they were putting out. Um, the text over here is from that Pittsburgh exhibition. Um, I think that kind of covers the majority of what I've got here in a nutshell. Uh, I've also got some of the music that is playing. I'll be playing records all day from Ghostbox Records. And I don't know how well it would show up on camera, but the projections that I have in the back are from that Pittsburgh exhibition. I had asked the Wood Street Gallery if it would be all right for me to take some pictures. They said yes. So I went ahead and I happened to have an I iPad and I thought I'm never going to see these projections again. I just want to capture some of that. So I, I cut that together in about a seven minute video before the Collectors and Collections event. I'm Jeff Michaels and my brother Jerry is a collection from my dad's orchestra. It started in 1937 and it was till 1967. And here are some pictures. There's a picture of my dad with a saxophone and his orchestra. Here's a poster from Random Lake. He played for the boat races out there. And here's some uh, interesting stuff I have here, pictures, and they played at the Pioneer when they opened up that time for the grand opening, and they <coughs> played uh, at Fox Hills when they had their opening, and at the River, or uh, I should, excuse me, the Paps Theater, and they played a lot of different places. I didn't know all of them. And here's kind of the history of the band. Here's some of the places that they played at, you can see. This is the original picture of the band from 1937 here. If I can get it up here. To Here are the, the, all the guys that played in the band. And here's kind of his business cards. Stationery. This is my brother Jerry. And I'd like you, okay, you tell me when you're ready for, okay, I want you to meet Don. He's one of the guys that are left, he and Bob Holler are two guys that I know are left from the band. And <coughs> Hi, John Madden, formerly of Sheboygan. And if you look over here to the far side, You'll see my stuff from high school, South High, 68. I was one of the few guys that had a letter sweater that was pretty popular back in the 40s and the 50s, but mine's obviously the 60s. I started collecting Sheboygan stuff approximately 30 years ago, besides my high school stuff. And uh, after college, my wife and I moved to New Mexico, and I was a band director for 33 and a half years. Um, Music is what made me a life, made my living, walked out of college in those days with no debts because I was playing in a rock and roll band. We played at Geno's four nights a week, the West Georgian Tea Company, and a couple other groups, so I always had a little coin in my pocket. And speaking of coins, down here on the table, I collect Sheboygan bar tokens. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, when you walked in a bar in the old days, You'd get a short beer, let's say it was a quarter, you throw down a dollar, and you wouldn't get 75 cents in change, but you would get 75 cents in good for type tokens from all these bars. And a lot of these bars are gone, but I've got over 1,100 different bar tokens from all, all different places. And then up here, this book is uh, tokens from H.C. Prangy. For one, five, ten, twenty-five cents, different stores, bus tokens, 
Good luck. And over here are from Masonic Lodge. And one of these was my grandfather. My grandfather was also a dentist in Sheboygan. And this is my casualty coming up here from New Mexico for today's show. In those days, a lot of the uh, businesses had to have two languages, one English, one German, for obvious reasons. Times have changed, and now it's English and Spanish. Behind me here, there's all sorts of things, different arrangements of mentioning my name in Sheboygan. This, was, this one here is just from a show that was in Sheboygan. Sheboygan Herald, 1879, cigars, arrowheads. They're pretty self-explanatory. Bank banks, tax certificates from the 1860s, and a little further over here, just some old things. I don't even know when the first one was. At the University of Wisconsin in Sheboygan, I was with the first group of the uh, what was known as the Chamber Singers, and we visited Germany back in 1969. We had fundraisers almost every day and it didn't cost anything because we raised enough money for about 30 of us to go. Uh, postcards down here in front of me. The way Sheboygan was from about 1910. Right there I've got about 350 different ones. Different stores put out different things to collect. Here's the, what is this, the 30th anniversary of H.C. Prangy which most of us are going to remember. I kept this one, John's Bar from World War II, deck of cards. Sometimes I find little things. A lot of companies had patches for their uh, employees to wear. Certainly I respect Sheboygan Police Department, Chair City. This goes on and on. Over here we got two of my favorite pieces. I also collect coins. This is a piece of what's known as national currency. Sheboygan's charter was number 11150. Five dollar bill, ten dollar bill, and twenty dollar bills were made, usually in sheets of four. And if you look at this serial number, this is the first twenty dollar bill that was made in 1929. And if my wife finds out how much I paid for it, I won't be welcome back home. This one here is self explanatory too. This is from a defunct bank that went under in the last century. And this is only one-sided. This is known as um, obsolete currency, 1856. But the novel thing here, it was signed by James Mead, a la Mead Library. This case here is something I made. I'm a barnwood guy. These are all sterling silver spoons, and they all have something in the bowl saying Sheboygan or cheese churches, children. And there's one little one here that actually says Sheboygan, 1894. Some of them have initials in the back, but these are all sterling. These arrowheads over here <coughs> were found in the late 50s at Double E and uh, Lakeshore Drive. Over here, this big board's got 30 different pennants that I've collected in the last three decades. This is the only one that's got uh, Sheboygan with the airport on, which is what, that's 61 years old now. Some central stuff, high schools. These are the ones that are tough to get with the extreme headdress on them with all the, they're supposed to look like feathers. But it's really nice stuff. On the table now, down here, are all my medals. Some are religious. Some are political. Some are schools. But if it says Sheboygan on them, I like this one. That's why I grew a beard. But if it says Sheboygan on them and it's a medal or a ribbon, I'll try to snap it up as best that I can. Central High closed in 1960, so do the math on that one. These little watch fobs were really, really popular. So popular that they put them on these um, political or military reunion ribbons. 
These are a couple of really good ones. That's, uh, I think those are both 1890-ish. I don't even, I can't read them. It could be Slavic or Polish, I'm not even sure. And here are some watch fobs, all with a different little belt on them, very popular in the 30s and pre-war. This is a check from the German bank. And that was originally at the corner of Michigan and 8th Street on the northwest corner. And it closed right around World War I because of the title of the bank. Germany's causing the war, so it kind of went under. And over here, these are also obsoletes, a one, a two, a three, and a five from the Bank of Sheboygan. Now, I'm going to be honest, these are all incredibly good copies. I have the originals, but they're a little bit hard to travel. So they're home, and that's that. And finally, there's my Harmony Bar jacket. I wear that in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and people know where I'm from, but they think it has to do with music because I was a band director, and uh, it's just fun wearing that, and I'm just honored and thrilled to be here. So I am Rebecca Schnabel. I am the collections assistant here at the Sheboygan County Historical Society and Museum, and I am currently standing in the museum's loft storage area. It is one of um, about four storage spaces we have at the museum. Um, it is one of the larger storage spaces that um, that we use. So the main things we store here include the mechanical animation from Prangies that we have collected over the years, including some of the examples I have out here. Um, we also have up here our garden toy collection, our locally manufactured furniture, and um, some of our Sheboygan Turner's gymnastics equipment, as well as some storage space for um, some of our prop material, especially for holiday memories, which most people um, in the area are probably quite familiar with. Um, so, seeing lots of our, our storage space, we make use of our high ceilings up here in the loft, trying to use as much space as we can in a safe and productive way. Um, so I can just kind of take a tour through the area. Um, I have been inventorying all of the items that are up here. So first off, I can start with my workspace, which is kind of over here, where I've been taking photographs, doing metadata entries, um, working with the space that we have. Um, next, I'll kind of show you, this is where we keep our garden toys. You can see our Santa Land elves. Um, I have one garden toy out right now, um, along with the catalog. That's actually from um, the 1930s uh, for people to see who are here today. And um, along with that, if we keep walking this way then, um, we can see this is where we keep a lot of our locally manufactured furniture. So we have our way furniture, we have a bench here produced by Kohler, the Kohler company. Um, we have armory chairs, um, kind of hidden in back. We even have old stadium chairs from um, Legion Park, I believe it was called. Um, we have other kinds of furniture and um, other kinds of electronics and couches and a lot of our chair collection you can see up top. Um, chairs and tables, as we know, chairs are a major part of Sheboygan history, part of the four C's of the city. Um, we have a few even pianos and organs. There are a few things up here that were not locally 
manufactured. Um, this lion here, which is a favorite of everybody's, was actually used in some of the windows at Prangy's as well. So he's part of the Prangy collection. Um, and as we come around the corner, we can see a lot more of our mechanical animation from Holiday Memories. So you may see some things you are quite familiar with over the years and maybe some things we haven't had out for a long time. Um, another thing a lot of people will recognize is the nativity that we have out every year. So that actually lives in these specially made crates. Um, it is objects that we spent a lot of time and resources on to conserve and repair. So um, we had specially made storage bins made for those. Um, and so yes, if we just keep moving forward, we'll just continue to see we have what we estimate is at least around 350 pieces of mechanical animation from Prangy's Boston Store Yonkers from the years. Um, and we're thinking it might be even more. Uh, we're just now inventorying all of it, so we'll finally have an exact answer. Um, we can also see as we look kind of this way, we have some more of our prop material that we use um, up above for um, holiday memories. And um, as we continue to move this way, it's a little hard to see because we've got the panels on it here, but Santa's throne lives up here as well. And then um, some more of our other kind of prop, mechanical props even as well as a lot of our um, collection materials, curtains, um, miniature buildings, um, miniature Christmas trees, all sorts of things like that. And uh, let's be honest, I saved the best for last, what everybody always wants to know. Um, we all know it's really Evergreen Park, but this is also the coveted home of the great Bruce the Spruce. So, as everybody always wonders too, you at least can kind of see this is the inside of Bruce. Um, these blue squares, as you see, are actually his eyes. So a lot of people ask if he's mechanical. He is not. We actually have a person sit inside him each year. Um, it rotates who's in there. Um, and they will actually look through those blue squares to be able to see you and your kids' smiling faces. So, yeah, um, thank you so much for joining me here up in our loft space.